What's up guys, welcome to Pete's Basement. I uh, got a little segment episode going on because Steve is sick, but uh, the bastard's editing even though he's sick, so we should all thank Steve, so <laughs> thanks Steve. Uh, all right, first off, I got a bunch of indie books and uh, you know, just like some, ra this, is, this is like my random book segment this week, but before I get to that, Amazing Spider-Man 673, The Epilogue to Spider Island, uh, I couldn't have asked for a better ending to a better Spidey story. This was possibly Dan Slott at his best. Um, it, it had such a classic feel and like just the way it ended with the city really like paying homage to Spidey. Uh, right in the last page, uh, they, they lit up the Empire State Building Forum, which was like really cool. Um, as Spidey being a New Yorker, that, that's like, you know, wow. Hey. They lit up the Empire State Building in Spidey Colors for me. Uh, Carly finds out that Peter Parker is Spider-Man in one of the best ways ever. She's like, Pete, I I'm a forensic detective. Did you fucking think I wouldn't figure it out? Everyone else had a learning curve with their spider powers. Everyone but you. You dove right in. Eh, she figured it out. Good for her. And, you know, like, if we remember that other piece of shit, Brand New Day, Doctor Strange set it up so that no one could ever figure out that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. But, uh, when Pete jumped on the lamppost there and called forth to everyone to, you know, get there, you know, called forth to all of those New Yorkers to beat up all the bad Spideys running around that were controlled by the Jackal, uh, you know, come and be a hero, use your spider powers for good, he weakened Doc Strange's spell and Doc Strange basically said, well now, you know, you didn't dismantle it because you didn't tell people you were Spider-Man, but you kind of revealed that you had spider powers and you did it of your own free will that weakened my spell. So now people can once again figure out that you're Spider-Man. Uh, and to me, that was pretty much just a nice smack in the face to Brand New Day and One Moment in, <clears throat> one moment in Time and all of that other bullshit that went on with Spidey a couple years ago that I absolutely hated. So, um, hopefully this opens up the doors to some really cool new Spidey stories. I couldn't have been any happier with what I read, and I'm really hoping that uh, at some point down the line, I, you know, I guess the hope of them fixing Pete and Mary Jane's marriage is, you know, a foregone conclusion, but I would like to see Spidey kick the fucking snot out of Mephisto. That's all I'm asking for right now. I think it's, you know... That he's not in his power level at all, but maybe like a team up with Thor or Doc Strange or something. Just go kick the shit out of Mephisto. That's all I'm asking for is to spy, spy to beat the devil himself. Alright, let's move on see what we got here. Uh, I took a shot at this other book called Monosite from IDW. Uh, the artwork is astounding and that's why I bought it. But uh, the story is very confusing. You've got these two races of immortals. Uh, the oligarchy, I believe I'm saying that right, the oligonostics, uh, who are basically like half half computer, half they used to be people, and the machines have like taken over the people and they're using them as mere vessels to kind of get around. They're like their cars for the machines, if you will. And the antediluvians, which is I believe a race of vampires or something, and they are led by al Kadar. they call him the green man, and he was the guy who taught Moses everything he knows. Uh, and then I think it's Moses that shows up later, who is the monocyte, and he's only got like one eye, and he's this really like bone-looking Giver motherfucker. It's just a weird book, it didn't make a lot of sense. It's pretty, don't get me wrong, but it's issue one of four, and it's four dollars, and that's not sixteen bucks that I'm gonna spend. Took another shot on this book from Action Labs, a small press company. The book is called Snowed In. A black and white book about these people, you know, four, a couple, two couples that go into, go up to a cabin and get stuck in a snowstorm, and all of a sudden, uh, one of the girl's ex-boyfriends, just happens to be her ex-boyfriend, uh, comes like barreling through, knocking on the door, help, help, and it, all the while he's talking about this thing that killed his uncle, and he's like, it's don't let it get in, it, I, I, I let it here, I was stupid, I should never have let it here, and all the while he's just calling it it. It and they're asking him, what the fuck are you talking about? He never tells him. And one by one, it starts picking off everybody around. And I was, a, you know, it was a fun ride. It really was. It was a one shot book, four bucks. Uh, I definitely wasted stupider money on dumber shit. But I was a little disappointed with the ending. I'm going to tell you why I was just ruining it for you. You never see it. 
You never even see it in a shadow. You just, it looks like a, it's a, like a white mist of some kind, and that they're all scared shitless of. Or it's invisible, because they're like, you know, do you see it? Do you see it? I see it. Oh, I don't fucking see it. I don't, show me something. Jordan, give me a fucking little random sketch in a shadow of Cthulhu or something. Anything. I, I, you know, I was really reading the whole thing, and I was really into it, and I'm like, they just like drop the ball at the end, which is kind of the case for most modern horror movies. I didn't care for it, really. Uh, one thing I definitely did care for was Fly Number 5. This is the story about a uh, drug that you inject and it gives you superpowers. And, you know, it gives you flight and I guess over time they've redeveloped the drug to add superpowers to it because this guy's ex-girlfriend was beating the shit out of him trying to get more drugs because she's like an addict to this fly stuff. And at the end of this, this is volume one, um... Uh, the little nerd, the guy whose father invented the drug, uh, is this dude's best friend whose ex-girlfriend beating the shit out of him. And he says, you know, like, I, I need something, just something to, you know, to give her that she get her off my case. And so he h hooks him up with this stuff that she said, that he says it'll take care of it. And he tells her it'll give her superpowers forever. Obviously, there's a lie. It's going to take her powers away. But the way in which that happens uh, is pretty unexpected. It doesn't just take her powers away. Uh, it's a fucked up story. It's really cool. It's not your typical Zenoscope tits in your face story, which I actually appreciate. Uh, I cannot wait for Volume Two to start next year. I definitely highly recommend you either pick this up and trade, or just go out and buy the issues one through five. Uh, this is one of the best things I've read all year. I'll tell you right now. It was so much fun, and I'm glad I got involved. I'm glad I took the chance on it. Dead Man's Run from Aspen, issue zero. This is just an introduction into this, uh, looks like post-apocalyptic world where they're talking about this prison and you don't really see, see it or anything, but they're talking about levels of this prison or whatever, and now they have to prevent the prison break, but now th in this prison there's no real um, guards, there's no cells, everybody's just kind of free to roam as they please, but they're locked in this prison. And the impression that they're giving you, and I believe I'm right here, is they, the guy says, uh, where, where is it? Uh, here we go, here we go. Uh, it's not just a prison, and it's not just filled with the most dangerous criminals the world has ever seen. Literally. It's hell. Literally. So this prison is hell, and it looks like a bunch of dead, crazy guys are trying to escape from hell. Um, it's a cool enough story. You know, it's... Anytime you're dealing with a small publisher, it's you're gonna take a chance uh, as far as distribution goes, as far as like release dates go. Um, Charismatic from Aspen is very slow going. I'm really enjoying it, but it's only up to issue three, and I, that you know it's like it comes out every two or three months. So you're taking a chance with Dead Man's Run, but it was an interesting enough story to get me to come back for at least issue one and see what's going on. So you might want to check that out. It wasn't half bad. Atlas United from Atlas Comics. Uh, this is the first story arc in this first story in a major company-wide crossover, and they're basically using it uh, as an excuse to kind of get you more in tune and more in touch with other characters from Atlas Comics, which is the company from the '70s that has resurfaced now. And um, there's a lot of characters that you know Atlas has to offer that I'm you know I'm not aware of because I wasn't around in the '70s. And I certainly, you know, I never really went back to look for comics like that because I didn't know about them. Uh, it's interesting, though, this story just kind of goes through all the different characters, and it reminded me of Chrono Trigger. They're all fighting this one big, like, cube, like a cosmic cube thing, like a metal cube in the air with tentacles coming out, but it's showing it in different times. Like, uh, you've got Phoenix in 2012 who's fighting it, You've got Cro Mag the Killer in 2300 BC, Scott Galland Star Walker in 2040. Uh, he's being attacked by the Q, Sergeant Hawk in 1943. You get the idea. What this it reminded me of Lavos from Chrono Trigger. Like you could go to each time and fight the bad guy, the last guy. It was like kind of up to you when you where you were when you fought him, and I think you got a different ending depending on which time you were in. Um, you know what? I, I said I hadn't been that interested in uh, some of the characters, some of the things going on in Atlas, like Wolf, and they introduced this guy Iron Jaw, and I was like, eh, whatever. <clears throat> um, 
the Grim Ghost was a little slow moving, but it's I still like the character enough to keep going. Phoenix um, is, is my favorite one by far. I'm still thoroughly enjoying that one. And because of that, I'm, I'm going to let myself read Atlas Unite, uh, Unified and see where it goes. Uh, pretty much because I like, I'm really enjoying Phoenix, and if this is going to have a lot to do with his storyline, uh, I'm definitely going to read it. Uh, in Atlas United Zero, he gets killed, and this guy's power is he keeps getting killed and he keeps coming back. But the more he comes back, is he's more a part of the alien race that made him a Phoenix in the first place. So, in theory, if he keeps dying too much, he'll become completely alien and no longer a human being. And then probably, I guess, he can't date his girlfriend because interstellar relationships just don't work. Um, <clears throat> but right at the end, he doesn't come back right away. And that's where they leave it. So, a bit of a cliffhanger. Oh, God, why isn't he not coming back? Come back, come back. Why haven't you come back yet? Obviously, he's going to come back. But uh, we'll see what happens. I'll pick up issue one and I'll keep you guys posted. Spaceman from Vertigo Comics, Brian Azzarello and Edward Riso. This was a weird book. Um, basically, you've got this, it looks like a half monkey man, half human astronaut, and everybody's in a post-apocalyptic uh, society, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. I really didn't understand it that much. Uh, I know Brian Azzarello is a very sick, twisted writer, I don't really know where he's going with this. It looks like that sometimes they're flashing back to, like, maybe be, this guy looks like he's on Mars or something, or maybe this is Earth, I'm not sure. But he's trying to get into the greenhouse to see why the plants aren't growing and I guess why the oxygen's not working. And then they do these flashes back to Earth where he's having, like, digital sex with this broad. And, you know, then they're talking about uh, these kids that are getting kidnapped. Uh, these people who run like a reality show contest to bring like who the winners into their lovely, gorgeous, I guess, pre-apocalyptic society or something. It's a very weird book, man. Very weird. A lot of shit going on. And I, I found it a little difficult to follow. Uh, I'd like to know if you guys read Spaceman. So um, hit us up, questions at peachbasement.com. Uh, Facebook us, facebook.com backslash Peach Basement. Hit us up on Twitter. Make sure you follow us on Twitter, guys, uh, for up-to-the-minute quick reviews of all uh, the books that we're reading. You know, we'll make a quick tweet about it and say whether it was good, whether it was bad, or, you know, just give a quick opinion on it. Team Hellions hit us up on Twitter. Want to know if we were going to review Heart. Uh, it's this new MMA book that's out. I didn't know nothing about it. Never heard of it. So, go check it out for next week. And also, if there's any... Uh, indie comic writers and artists out there, any publishers that want us to review some stuff of theirs, we got a new address, guys. Send anything you'd like us to review to peachbasement.com, 402 Graham Avenue, that's Graham is in the cracker, box 209, Brooklyn, New York, 11211, and we'll go check it out, and we'll give you our opinion on it. Moving on, we got a couple more books, we got Vault number three, um... This book didn't end too bad, you know, it was, uh, there was uh, obviously a greedy human scumbag that let loose the angel of death. Uh, I kind of wish that the, you know, creature would have formed into some sort of devil, would have, you know, been made flesh or something, but that never happened. Uh, it was still was just, just skeleton spider thing that they had to fight off, and, you know, it, it treated it like, um, three pieces of a horror movie. It was a cool story. Surprisingly enough, it was all, like I said, it was only three issues, three dollars and fifty cents each. So I would call it worth it. You know what? They didn't drag it on too much. It was a little slow going in the beginning, as I guess any movie is. And but once the action started, it dove right into it, and it didn't really deal too much with having to find out a story, what the fuck this thing is, or anything else. It's killing us. We have to stop it. Enough said. Uh, definitely a cool story. I, I enjoyed it. Stitched. From Avatar Press, issue one. I bought this because Garth Ennis is writing it. Um, basically, you've got these creatures running around the desert, um, ripping people's intestines out through their mouths. Doesn't look like a comfortable way to go. And uh, they are being controlled by some dude in dressed all in black uh, who's swinging a can of beans around and it's making like little chink noises, like chink, 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 chink. 
or I don't know, I remember if they're beans or coins or whatever the fuck they are, but either way, they're in a can, and uh, th this controls these creatures who are like, I guess they were human beings and they're like sewn together or stitched together, I guess. Uh, what it comes down to is Garth Ennis is a sick fuck, and uh, these creatures are attacking American troops in Afghanistan. They're attacking Al Qaeda too, so I guess they're not being controlled by the terrorists. Um, it was a cool enough story to get me to come back to see what's up with issue two. Um, basically, the uh, this rescue team gets dropped into Afghanistan because the uh, the helicopter went down, took on some enemy fire, and they were there to rescue some other troops, and they wind up. The troops that were supposed to get rescued wind up rescuing these guys from these creatures. Uh, they're, they're not immortal. You know, they got obviously a little bit of super strength with the whole intestine ripping out thing. But uh, they can be killed. One of the dudes blows their head off and I swear he looks like the thing's crying. Oh, uh, it's pretty creepy. So uh, I'm definitely going to come back for issue two and see what's up with that. Haunted City, issue one from... Aspen again and Wonderland Press. Uh, this was a cool story. I've been looking forward to this since issue zero. Basically, this looks at what if New York was haunted by every single creature, every demon that anyone of any religion in the world believes in. Because New York, be New York City being the melting pot, uh, everyone from all walks of life comes here, and with them come the demons, their myths, their legends, which are obviously real and running around New York, which is the biggest haunted house in the world. Uh, right now, we're dealing with uh, some child kidnappings and murders by a creature called the Morrigan from, I believe it's Gaelic myth. Uh, this was definitely a fucking cool story. And I'm coming back for issue two. I highly recommend you do it as well. Finally, from IDW, my favorite fucking story was H.P. Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror. Uh, if you are not a fan of H.P. Lovecraft, you do not like horror stories. This guy wrote horror on a cosmic scale. He is the creator of Cthulhu. He is the creator of a bunch of other elder gods with a bunch of consonants in their name that I don't dare try to pronounce. I'm lucky I got Cthulhu right. Uh, this basically tells the story of this, you know, group of kids. Um, think It, kind of like Stephen King's It. And they, they know about this ancient evil that they've been guarding, you know, inadvertently they wound up being the guardians of this thing and now it's escaped and it killed one of them already and now the other four have to band together to go and find it but it's invisible and it's killing a lot of things it's killing cattle right now and it's getting stronger uh, this is a fuck, it's a sick, sick story along with this you get another quick uh, H.P. Lovecraft story in here called um the Hound, adapted by Robert Weinberg. And you also get like a kind of a little history of H.P. Lovecraft to go along with it. This guy was one of the most brilliant, psychotic writers ever. Um, there's also a couple of rumors that he wasn't just writing it, he really thought it was real. Uh, you know, that he thought Cthulhu and the other guys were going to come back at some point. Maybe they were talking to him through his writing. Some sick, sick stuff. Uh, I cannot wait for issue two. I'm so glad that they're adapting Lovecraft stories. I've always been a fan. Uh, you should definitely go out and check out the Necronomicon, which is uh, on sale on Amazon and overstocking, eBay, whatever. Pick this stuff up, guys. Uh, if there's anything else you want to let us know about, you know the deal, guys. Hit us up. Questions at PeachBasement.com. Tell it, hey, dudes, you should know about this shit. Whatever. Alright, I'm gonna go finish my iced tea and I'll turn you over to the rest of the boys. Hey, so as you heard what Pete said, I am Zek, that's true. <coughs> um, I have a 100 degree temperature, so I figured instead of going to the basement and infecting everybody, um, I'll just stay here and keep myself sick. So, um, so segments. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done them anyway, so... Oh, that's a, that's NyQuil. NyQuil. It's empty. I got my tea. All right. So <clears throat> let's start with uh, let's start with mm, let's start with Detective Number Three. 
Um, I like the. I think it's going at a good pace. It's only issue three. Um, I think. The, I mean, he, Batman has figured out, or he thinks he has a pretty good idea of who Dollmaker is, and why he's doing what he's doing to Gordon. <clears throat> and um, I mean, we knew it wasn't Gordon in the last issue. I mean, they're not gonna kill Gordon. If they did, the, the nerds and geeks will riot. So, um, I think it'll wrap up in the next issue. So, um. It's good. I still like it. Good art, good writing. It's all by one man, right? Tony Daniel. Um, okay, the X Men's. Uncanny number one came out. Uh, Cyclops' team. Uh, good art, good story. I like Mr. Sinister. Always kind of liked him as a villain. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the only thing that I'm hesitant about is uh, I liked when Juggernaut, when. Cyclops became Juggernaut. I mean, he's kind of built for the job. But in this issue, I think he's talking to Storm or somebody or Jubal. Or so, I forget who he's talking with. But um, he, he's getting angry and he wants. I think he's going up against um, War Machine, and he's about to turn on, turn into Juggernaut. And they'll, I think it's Storm. And Storm's like, no, don't. We don't need Juggernaut for this. Don't calm down. And, he's, and then Juggernaut, uh, Colossus is able to quell that desire to get angry and hulk out and become the juggernaut and it's just something that i think there's going to be a problem because it's just i can just see it every issue where he's going to have that hulk dilemma where he needs you know <coughs> i i kind of like colossus becoming juggernaut but now i'm kind of regretting it um i don't know i i'm also delirious on medication so um, X-Men 20 came out, now, I should have thrown that away, if you look at the back of, uh, I'll scan it up so you guys can see it, um, of the back of Uncanny X-Men, I'm sure other books, there's like a little, uh, um, chart of who was on what, okay, the, the overall Cyclops X-Men team, and then who was in what subcategory, um, and in the security recon category, there's Psylocke, Domino, Warpath, and Jubilee. All right, so then now you got X-Men number 20, and it deals largely with um, that team. Uh, Domino, who's, who's come back recently, uh, kind of re-emerged last, last year, two years ago, with um, X with Wolverine and, and X-Force, that love and sex, or sex and whatever it was called, the three-issue, it was good, but the three-issue little thing. Um... Oh, actually, it's in this issue, the, 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 the dilemma with Colossus and Storm. Um, I'll scan that up, too, just so you can see it. Uh, so, but it was good artwork, and I, I like, um, I think if they keep going with Uncanny, uh, I mean, in regular X-Men, in this direction, where <clears throat> it doesn't have to necessarily link to the larger Uncanny X-Men story, where it's just a smaller, you know, thing, then I, I, I'll keep getting it, so... Amazing 673 came out. The epilogue. I was a little, a little scared about it being a large like aftermath thing. There's a lot of Marvel events have um, these long aftermath things, where it's a year's worth of of rebuilding and all that bullshit. But uh, this was one issue, so hopefully it doesn't go past this one issue. Um, and it ends very nice. Um, I already watched Pete's. Um, a segment, so I'm not going to put that up there again, uh, but, uh, but the artwork was good, and, the, you know, the humor was good, Dan Slott's good at the humor, and, uh, you know, you kind of saw the Carly Cooper thing and Peter Parker happening where they're going to break up, and I, and <coughs> I know it's going to happen because I know they're going to try to put them back together, Mary Jane and Spider-Man, it's going to happen, it might not happen tomorrow, it might not happen in 2012, it's coming up, right? But it'll happen soon, soon enough. They're going to get back together. Um, Villains for Hire. I didn't put it on my list, but I looked at it. You know, the artwork has always been good for Heroes for Hire. And um, I like the story for Heroes for Hire. And um, I'm a sucker for Silver Sable when she's in this. So I figured, well, let me pick it up. So basically, this is... Um, this is the this is the ish episode of a TV show where it features a lot of the uh, 
main characters of that TV show, but then also features some other characters for the spin-off that they're going to have. That's kind of what this was about. It has all the regular Heroes for Hire characters, but they're kind of segueing to a possible spin-off for Villains for Hire. Um, I don't know how long Villains for Hire is going to last. The concept behind it makes sense. I mean, if you have people that you're hiring to combat crime, you're going to have people you're going to hire to commit crime. So, you know, the concept makes sense. <coughs> so, we'll see how long that goes. I'm really glad they brought Silver Sable back. Damon Hellstrom, however, hmm. uh, and then last but certainly not least, book of the week for me was, what do you think it is? Can you guess? Can you guess? Yeah, you got it. Goon. Goon 36. He seems to be coming out with these every two weeks, every two weeks, I wish, every two months now, and that's a good pace. That's a good enough pace. It, uh, <clears throat> Roxy Delight. She seems to be a real person. <coughs> I'll scan those pictures up of her. Calm down, Ramon. And, um, she features, she's featured in this. She's basically like a burlesque talent. And her plane crashes and she ends up where, you know, Goon lives. And, um, the burlesque house was closed down by the Goon. Um, so she's like, screw that, I'm going to back, open it back up. So she opens it back up, and there's a whole big thing. and then, But uh, it's really good. And the best part, or one of the best parts, oh, there she is. One of the best parts is, um, at one point, she's trying to get away. She's got this really, she's got this box that's really um, worth a lot of money. And the goon already was trying to sell it to somebody, and she stole it. So, he, of course, they're going after her. And um, they're trying to get in this air balloon. I'll scan that, and it says uh, on the sign, the sign on the, on the air balloon sign says, balloon ride, safety not guaranteed, keep <clears throat> keep wide stance in basket, because rats done chew out most of the bottom. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. Such Goon is such a, you know, you have a really horrible day, you open up Goon at the end of the day, and you're like, ah, that's good stuff. So, uh, that's it for me. Uh, next week, <coughs> we'll see you next week. I'll be better by then. Like I would. And uh, that's it. Welcome to another exciting episode of Ramon's Basement. <laughs> a nice cash to it, don't it? But anyways, um, another segment episode of our Beast Basement. Um, Pete went crazy last week, assaulting us and shit. So, you know, we're not going until he apologizes. Fuck. Oh, shit on another one of his comic books. Anyways. First up, DC. Action Comics number three. Um, It's alright. Um, Okay, again, I'm coming from the point of view of uh, the guy who's collected for a while and the guy who who's seen this shit already and... I don't really care about the history, origin, and shit like this. I don't want to go through all that nonsense again. I want to get into the the good stuff. Um, kind of depressing book, actually, with the whole um, death of um, Krypton and shit, and obviously they mentioned Kandor and whatnot. Let's see what happens, see what they do, and see why they change, or is it just going to be just... I don't know. Um, it, it's, it's a wait and see for me. American Vampire 20 starts a new story arc, if you will. American Indian Vampires. Hey. Um. Mm, it's a good book. It's always going to be a good book, I think, I feel. <coughs> and, um. It's just going to be one of those books, like, a few, like another one that I'll be reviewing later on, that we actually should not review as much because it's so damn good. It's consistent. When it stops being consistent, that's when, um, we'll let you know. Detective Comics number three, um, surprisingly good, even from my point of view. It's, I like it, I'm just on for the ride. It's the third issue, it's, you, you assume it's the halfway point because everything's six issues nowadays. So let's see where the shit takes us. <clears throat> I Vampire. 
too. I don't even know if it just came out this week. But anyways, um, okay, I like it. The art is a bit more miss than the hit. I love the concept art. I love the idea of it. The cover art is gorgeous, obviously, but then there's a massive canyon between the cover art and the interiors, and that annoys the shit out of me, actually. And, um, as much as I love seeing Alex Ross's covers and all these other motherfuckers' covers, um, I want to see the inside artist cover on the front of this shit. I want to know what I'm getting. I am not one of those guys in the comic shop that likes to flip through the books at the shop. That's just annoying. Get the fuck out of the way. But anyways, I digress. <clears throat> Actually, I think I Vampire should be drawn by Ed Bennis. I mean, there'll be any characters, um, like Queen Vampire Woman, who I forget um, her name. And well, it's a woman, so she should be drawn by Ed Bennis. But no, he's drawing Red Lantern. So Red Lantern's number three. Um... I don't know why they're doing this book. Who acts for this book? Um, I can understand the Sinestro Corpse book if Sinestro was in it. <clears throat> He's not. Actually, going to face him next week. That should be good. I, I don't understand. And Ed Bennis, I mean, obviously now they're bringing up Bleeze, the female character with the wings and all that stuff. Because she's a female. Ed Bennis does female. He's known for doing females. I mean, he's Brazilian, I believe, and well, hey. Oh, well, normally I'd be happy to see females drawn beautifully. Um, I, I just the whole book's a, a big miss. The art's good, obviously. The story's decent for what it is, but no. Next we have um, Stormwatch number three came out this week. <clears throat> now, Stormwatch is originally Wildstorm from Image. Image book, Wildstorm Company. That's Jim Lee's baby before he fucking abandoned it. And, um, this book isn't even, it, it's called Stormwatch, but it's really authority. It's the authority repackage. Because, obviously, if you're going to have a, um, a team in the DC Universe called Authority, they're going to be villains. Let's be real. Just villains. So they revamped them a little bit, gave them a, a newer, nicer name, and kind of toned them down a bit as of now. If you don't know the authority, you should fucking pick up the first series. You really should. I'm not even going to describe it. It's just awesome. It's just incredible, badass, just awesome. So, um, here you have pretty much the whole authority team. Slight changes here and there. And Martian Manhunter, who admits to being in the Justice League, but when he wants to be a warrior, he goes to Stormwatch. Now, obviously, they do epic shit. Epic, the moon just blow up, for crying out loud. So, how does Ramon feel about it? Eh, eh, it's, I want Stormwatch, I want, you know, um, Battalion, I want Fiji, I want the rest of the crew, and, <clears throat> anyways, then we have Marvel, wow, did I just do that? Yeah, I did, um, see what happens with that organized? Fuck up, we do not have Marvel, we have Dynamite, Warlord of Mars starts a new story arc, which continues the older story arc. Um, John Carter has a son. He bangs Asia Thoris. Yeah, it's Marvel. And, um, that's it. It's a good book. I'm not going to say it. That's how I'm reviewing it. It's a good book. But, eh, you know, eh. It's just going on. It's just another book. <clears throat> then we have Image Invisible, 84. Awesome book. Awesome series. Something we would not be reviewing every month because it's damn awesome. It just is. I um. I've started with the trades. I suggest everybody starts with the trades. I prefer the trades over the omnibus. It's just so damn huge. You know what I'm saying? And <clears throat> anyway, that's just my preference. If you do what you want, obviously, but yeah. Now we have um Marvel. See, I have to do alphabetical company order. It's just my thing. Um, first up, we have Fear Itself 7.1. Really? Bucky's still alive. It was in a cheesy way. <clears throat> um, I understand what it did. I understand why they did it. I felt it was kind of cheesy. I'm looking forward to Winter Soldier. I'm looking forward to them canceling Captain America and Bucky. 
You cannot have three Captain America books. No, fuck that. There are too many X-Men books. There are too many Spider-Man books. There are too many Wolverine books. There are too many damn books in Marvel Universe. Tone the shit down. Other than that, I really am looking forward to Winter Soldier in 2012. Then we have Thor. Um, the Deviant Saga number one came out, which is Thor, the side boob saga came out. <clears throat> this is villain in this... That, that she's nothing but side boob. It's it's just like, it's almost distracting. You know, um, the story's alright. It's nothing huge. If you don't know who the deviants are, look up also the Eternals. Look up Celestials. They were created by the Celestials here on Earth a while ago. And that brings me up to, um... <laughs> alright, Celestials are hugely cosmic beings. You know, there's cosmic beings like Thanos, and then there's the Celestials. They're just on a whole different branch. You know what I'm saying? Um... The only thing more powerful than the Celestial would probably be um, Galactus, who does battle them. Um, God. Um, certain um, Living Tribunal, Eternity. Beings like that. You have to be that strong to take the top of Celestial. Okay, so, you know, Thor's involved today. You know, Thor's like a cosmic neighbor, you know what I'm saying? So why the hell not, you know? But, um, the X-Men, really? Uncanny X-Men number one. That is my only gripe. They fucking run with Celestial. Now I love the book. It is awesome. It is awesome. This is just the whole team and what everybody does and the whole extinction team and how they I mean Scott Summer said himself. We are the baddest team. We're the most powerful team on earth. <coughs> Excuse me. They're right. He's right. It is a kick ass team. It is a team that's screams overkill for both situations. Against the Celestial? No, they're against Banks. But, um, it's just, it's really, really good. I like the way to describe what other teams are doing and what's going on in Utopia and whatnot. <clears throat> that aside, leave the Celestia alone. Sinister coming in, I'm not going to say what's what. You know, pick up the book yourself. I really don't like them messing around with Celestia. I mean, they have the whole, X-Men are somewhat cosmic because, uh, Dark Phoenix, because of their relations to the Shi'ar and whatnot, and, and the Brood. <clears throat> I think that's as far as it should go. Fucking wrong with Celestia is just, you know what? And um, just to point it out there, the Annihilators will beat the shit out of the Extinction team, if you will. Just, just had to say it. Just had to. The geek in me had to say, you know, Scott Summers or somebody else out there won't badass any. Of you. God forbid the Annihilators or um. The Heralds of Galactus get together. You're, you're, you're assed out, you know? You're assed out. <clears throat> okay. We have X-23. Um, oh, my God. What the hell did I do with reading that? Um, uh, the Enigma Force, that um, Captain Universe thing. Uh, I, oh, my God. What are they doing to this girl and this character? <sighs> she is a Wolverine clone. She should be Wolverine, doing Wolverine type shit. No. They have her fucking around with demons. She lost a part of her soul and all this nonsense. She's a great character. She has so much to explore. So much to do. So much to discover. So much to be. And they went this angle. Fail. Crap book of the week. Well, my book of the week is Invisible. 84. Okay, I didn't mention that earlier. I'm sorry. It is. Then we have X-Men 20. Um, X-Men 20, the team so far, is pretty much X-Force. The first X-Force, which I'm, I was a fan of and I prefer over the second one, to tell you the truth, with Storm as leader. And this is interesting because they're out there hunting sen Sentinels and shit like that. And pick up the book. Pick up the book. It's a good book. It's close. It's almost book of the week. But I have a bias when it comes to Invisible. It's just that damn good in the grand scheme of things. Single issue... Single issue book of the week. Hmm. Um. Ooh. Probably Uncanny X Men or X Men Twenty. Yeah, one of those two. I don't know. Stop making me choose. Stop it. On that end, I'm done. Um. Hopefully next week we get together and Pete apologizes. If not, me. And next time I won't be wearing this. Hey. Okay. I'm leaving. Bye. All right, Steve, I promise to keep this segment about 12 minutes long 
And if I don't, you have permission to actually hit me back next show. <coughs> Good, now anyway, we got that out of the way. Uh, Scott Garland, Scar Walker, Scott Galland, Scar Walker, 20, stop. Why wow, can't fucking talk? What the fuck? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. But look on the bright side, at least you get to hit me next week. Not in the nuts, please. That's all I ask. This is what we like, guys. We like getting recommendations from you just as much as you like getting recommendations from us. You know, we can't see everything. Sometimes we miss some shit. So if you want to see this review, get the uh, fucking cunt motherfucker. The fuck is that? Something with camera. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, so that's how I feel about American Vampire. Good shit. Mom's basement. Nice catch to it, don't it? All right, Pete. You and your 20-minute segments. <coughs> <coughs>